Welcome to the discussion of chapter three of The Richest Man in Babylon, Seven Cures to a Lean Purse. Hopefully you're coming here from off of the summary video. Let's look more in depth into The Richest Man in Babylon, chapter three, The Seven Cures for a Lean Purse. So the story here is, and I apologize, I got my book right next to the, the microphone, so I'm sorry for that extra audio there. So the story here is we've got King Sargon and he's, as any good leader should be, He's concerned about the poverty and welfare of his people, and he wants to make sure that everybody's getting as much financial mobility as they can. And he and his chancellor have a conversation regarding the fact that the vast majority of the wealth is held by a pretty significant minority of the people. And we see that here in our day too, don't we? I mean, don't we see that, I mean, the 1%, right? So much of the world's wealth is held by such a small minority. Now there's a lot of wisdom that's exercised here by King Sargon and his chancellor. The king asks here, why should so few men be able to acquire all the gold? And his chancellor responds, because they know how. One may not condemn a man for succeeding because he knows how. Neither may one with justice take away from a man what he has fairly earned to give to men of less ability. So it's pretty blatant right there in this book that to take from the rich and redistribute to the poor, essentially the, the, the core message of socialism is not sound financial practice, right? A lot of, and we're gonna get just a little political here and you of course are totally welcome to disagree with me on this. Um, it's a very highly charged issue. And so, you know, anything that I say that you disagree with, please don't take it personally. I'm not saying you're a bad person. Idea held, right? in the socialistic movement of wealth redistribution. The idea of, well, all those people have all that money. They don't deserve all of that money. They don't need all of that money. Let's take some of that money and give it to the people who are having a hard time feeding their kids. It's, it's kind of a very Robin Hoody type idea, right? In what I've seen, a lot of the justification in that idea of taking from the rich and giving to the poor comes from the idea that those rich people don't deserve that money or they gained that money in you know, nefarious or unethical ways, or that they inherited that money or so forth and so on, and that they and that they, they don't have a right to it, as it were. Let me just try to dispel that myth right now. The reality is the vast majority of wealthy people in our country earned that wealth. And I don't, you know, and that's not just America, that's, that's any given free market country. That's what the beauty of a free market is. The beauty of a free market is that we have the ability to generate our own wealth and to build our own destinies. So this idea that let's take from the rich, give to the poor because the rich didn't earn that or it's it's not ethical for them to have that much, it's addressed you know pretty directly here in the book. One may not condemn a man for succeeding because he knows how. Remember in chapter one and chapter two of this book, we've made it pretty clear, there are very specific laws to money and the people who follow those laws gain wealth. This is the prime time in the history of the world to become an independently wealthy person. And if you're watching this video, you are relatively a wealthy person already by the comparison of the most of the rest of the world. Nobody can blame you for wanting to do better, but King Sargon and his chancellor here would say that it is not an appropriate solution to take money from the people who know those laws and know how to follow them. Again, very political, very opinionated. You may agree with me, you may not, that's okay. But there's no question at all that that is what this book is teaching. We earn our own wealth and it is not wise or prudent or fair to take money from those who have earned it to give to those who don't know how to earn it. So the king and his chancellor come to the conclusion that they need to hire Arkad, who, you know, is famous for his wealth, uh, and have him teach teachers what it was that he did to become wealthy and so that those teachers can then go out and teach other people. This principle is obviously the principle of sharing wisdom. There is no secret to wealth. It's just intelligence, prudence, and wisdom. You really only need a second grade level of intelligence to become a wealthy person. The rest is in wisdom and action. So fast forward a little bit, we're now in this uh, teaching room with Arkad and as Arkad walks in, right, his hundred students are watching him and they all kind of start whispering with each other, oh man, there he is, that's him, that's Arkad. And somebody answers, or somebody whispers, he is but a man even as the rest of us. And I love that point. The point of the author saying that is a lot of the time we hold wealthy people as though they're elect, as though they're elite, as though they're special, as though there's something fantastical about them. And the reality is they're just people. TV shows and magazines and, and reality TV, you know, whatever, they love to portray wealthy people as though they're extra human. And they're not. They're just people. Sorry if that 
rob some of the excitement out of that idea from you, but they're just normal people like you and me, which is actually a very, very good thing because it means that you and I can do it too. There's nothing special about those wealthy people. Whether you're looking at Hollywood people or big business people or whoever it is you're looking at that has way more money than you, they're just human, which is good because so are you, which means you have every opportunity to become what they were, at least financially, maybe not popularity as far as the Hollywood thing, but as far as financially, you can do it too. They are not special, no more special than you are. So Arkad begins teaching his seven cures for a lean person. The first one, uh, again, was the PYF, pay yourself first, 10%. This is a direct build off of the last chapter where Arkad learned from Algamish that a part of all you earn is yours to keep, right? And at this point, Arkad makes the point, well, all of you have jobs, right? All of you are making money, right? And they all, all the, the, the teachers in the room are like, well, yeah. And he says, then if each of you desireth to build for himself a fortune, is it not wise to start utilizing that source of wealth which is already established? In other words, well, if you want more money, maybe you should start with the money you're currently getting. Dave Ramsey has a quote, something to the effect of your income is your number one wealth building tool. And that's exactly what's being said here as well. You wanna become wealthy, you've already got the primary tool in doing that, a job. So we need to utilize that. And, and in here in this cure, cure number one is the PYF. Take that income that you're getting, take 10% of it and set it aside. And then he does this very simple analogy with a, an egg merchant and says, hey, if you have X many, if you have 12 eggs and you only sell 11 of them, what's gonna happen after X amount of time? And the idea is, well, I'm gonna continue to have more eggs because I would have one left over and then I'd have two left over and then I'd have three left over. And the idea is, well, yeah, eventually you're gonna have a whole pile of eggs. And that's exactly what the PYF system is all about. If you get a paycheck of $2,000 and you set 200 of it aside, how much money are you gonna have? Well, you'll have $200 and then you'll have four and then you'll have six and then you'll have eight. And after the course of just a year, you'll have $2,400. And after two years, you'll have $4,800. And that's the principle of PYF is you take just a bit of your paycheck and you set it aside. I really like what Arkad says here. Which desirest thou the most? Is it the gratifications of thy desires of each day, a jewel, a bit of finery, better raiment, more food, things quickly gone and forgotten? Or is it substantial belongings, gold, lands, herbs, merchandise, income bringing investments? This is a direct reference to the two marshmallow idea, which we talked about in the last chapter two discussion video, right? The two marshmallow idea. What do you want more? Do you wanna have the fast food cheeseburger? Do you wanna have the, the experience at the movie theater? Do you wanna have the nice little gratifying things now that six months from now you're not gonna care about? Or do you wanna have financial independence, wealth, security, a financial future? Do you want the first marshmallow or do you want the second marshmallow? If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and watch chapter two discussion. Obviously, if we're gonna become the financially wealthy, we need to be willing to say no to the things that we want now in favor of the things that we want later. So what's the second cure? Arkad goes on another day, right? It's it's one day for each of these conversations that happens in the story. So another day he talks about uh, the second cure, which is control thy expenditures, which is basically the principle of budgeting. If you don't have a budget, I have a whole series of videos on how to create a budget. One, I have a series of videos on how to create a budget using Microsoft Excel. And I have a series of videos on how to create a budget using Google Sheets. I would strongly encourage you to take a look at those videos if you do not have a functioning budget that you like. You must manage your money. You must, you absolutely must. This is one of those laws of gold kind of thing. He's talking about seven cures for a lean purse. In other words, hey, if you don't have as much money as you want to, here's seven things you need to do. And one of them is have a budget. Confuse not the necessary expenses with thy desires. Each of you together with your good families have more desires than your earnings can gratify. In other words, we all want tons of stuff. I've got a whole laundry list of things I would love to buy right now. I can't afford all of them. We need to make sure that we're being careful to not confuse things that we want with things that we need. That's the purpose of a budget. When you're creating a budget, you wanna start by budgeting money, by setting money aside specifically for the things that you need. And once you have all the things you need paid for, such as rent, 
groceries, utilities, so forth. Once you have those set aside, then you use whatever money's left to start budgeting for the things that you want, such as your child's piano lessons or whatever. He goes on to, he goes on to talk about how it's important for us to keep track of our own spending habits. And I talk about that as well in my budgeting videos. I really like this segment of this. Uh, so here again, we're in the story idea of Arcad teaching a room full of 100 people. Hereupon, one of the students wearing a robe of red and gold arose and said, I am a free man. I believe that it is my right to enjoy the good things of life. Therefore, I do rebel against the slavery of a budget, which determines just how much I may spend and for what. I feel it would take much pleasure from my life and make me little more than a pack ass to carry a burden. So in other words, it's this idea of, I'm a free man, I don't wanna have to follow a budget, I don't wanna have to be restricted in what I do. I mean, I guess if that's the way you feel, the question I would ask is, how you doing? What has that mentality done for you so far? How much debt are you in? Do you have more debt than you do net worth? But Arkad has a really good response to this. He says, who my friend would determine thy budget. I would make it for myself, responded the protesting one. In that case, were a pack ass to budget his burden, would he include therein jewels and rugs and heavy bars of gold? Not so. He would include hay and grain and a bag of water for the desert trail. The purpose of a budget is to help thy purse to fatten. We all want to be wealthy. Why are you fighting against this? It is to assist thee to have thy necessities and, insofar as attainable, thy other desires. It is to enable thee to realize thy most cherished desires by defending them from thy casual wishes. In other words, if, if you don't like the idea of being restricted by a budget, then you're looking at a budget completely wrong. The purpose of a budget is to give you freedom to do what you want to do. You want to send your kid to college, I presume. Well, a budget will help you do that. You want to pay down your house faster, I presume. A budget will help you do that. You want to be able to X, Y, Z. A budget will help you do that. The purpose of a budget is to help you determine how to best send, uh, spend your money. It's not meant to restrict you. It's meant to help you. So if you have this negative idea of a budget and the idea of creating and running a budget seems oppressive to you, then you've got the, you've got the wrong mentality and whoever taught you what a budget was probably didn't teach it to you well. I would encourage you to go watch some of my videos on how to do that. Cure number three, Arcad goes into uh, make thy gold to multiply. In other words, investing. I tell you, my students, a man's wealth is not in the coins he carries in his purse. It is in the income he buildeth the golden stream that continually floweth into his purse and keepeth it always bulging. In other words, it's about investing. Putting your money where there is interest that can be gained, right? If you put your money in a glass jar and hide it under your bed, you've got that money and that's good, it's better than nothing, but it's not building. But if you put your money into sound investments with an interest rate, then there's room for your money to grow because of the interest. Make sure you take that money and reinvest it. Don't take it out as dividends or anything. Reinvest all of that capital gains and dividends so that your interest can collect more interest. We call this compound interest. Cure number four, he goes into guard thy treasures from loss. Basically, Arcad makes it clear that there are no secrets. There are no tricks. There are no shortcuts to making and building standing secure wealth. Be not misled by thine own romantic desires to make wealth rapidly. Is it wise to be intrigued by larger earnings when thy principal may be lost? I say not. The penalty of risk is probable loss. In other words, if, you know, in our day, if somebody comes to you with this really awesome, you know, investment opportunity, promising you 25% return, it sounds great. 25% return would be fantastic. But if it's too good to be true, it probably, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is, right? Just be very, very critical about any thing that sounds too good to be true. The fifth cure he talks about is buying property so that the money that you are spending each month isn't going to a landlord, but instead is going to building equity in your home. Just make sure that you're doing it in the appropriate time and in the appropriate way. Dave Ramsey has a lot of information on that particular topic, but what Arcad is teaching here is that it's important for us to build up our asset pool. We do that by investing, we do that by saving, we can do that by buying property, anything that makes us more valuable. The sixth cure is ensure a future income. It behooves a man to make preparations for a suitable income in the days to come when he is no longer young and to make preparations for his family should he no longer be with them to comfort and support them. In other words, 
we're all gonna die someday. You should do what you can to prepare your family financially for the day that you die. You don't know when that's going to be. It could be tomorrow. Are you prepared? Do you have life insurance? Do you have investments in place to help cover your family's loss of income? Because again, that's the primary purpose of life insurance is to cover the loss of income once you've passed away. So do you have any of that in place? If you don't, get on it because the day will come and who knows when that you're not gonna be around to take care of your family anymore. And then Arkad makes a really good point here as far as the necessity of making small payments, the PYF, into this future fund. Surely, when such a small payment made with regularity doth produce such profitable results, no man can afford not to ensure a treasure for his old age and the protection of his family, no matter how prosperous his business and his investments may be. The point he just got finished making right before he said this was the idea of if you just set aside a gold or a silver per week or something like that, eventually you're gonna have hundreds of silver. For us, right, if you just set aside $300 a month, well, after the first year, you've got $3,600. After the second year, you've got $7,200. That's just two years. What if you kept doing that for a decade? What about two decades? But even better, what if instead of just doing that into a glass jar or a savings account with less than 1% interest, what if you did that into an investment account that's 7% interest? When you do just the basic simple level math and realize just how much wealth you could be building up, you can't afford not to be doing this. It's so easy to make money when you take small amounts with regularity and put it into an interest bearing account. I have other videos on that topic as well on my channel. The seventh cure, increase thy ability to earn. Basically this one is all about just doing whatever you can to make sure that you are as profitable in the market as possible. See, here's the thing, you are a commodity. You are a product. I don't mean to take the life and the humanity out of who we are, we are people. In a free market, as an employee, or as a potential employee, you are a commodity. Just like you go to the store to buy milk because that is a commodity that you desire, employers desire you as a commodity to make them money. The more valuable and the more rare and the more special that you can make yourself, the more valuable of a commodity you are. And the more valuable you are, the more people are willing to pay for you. In other words, higher paychecks. So whatever you can do to build up your element of worth in the market. He talks about the necessity of having good work ethics and making sure that you are a good employee. Good employees can be very difficult to come by. If you can be a good employee, you will become a more valuable commodity. He goes on to talk about the necessity of paying your debts and getting out of debt. The necessity of taking care of your family so that you can build a sense of self-respect and respectability. To make sure everything is set in place and in order in case you should pass away unexpectedly. That gives you a sense of calm, peace, comfort, and reliability. Showing compassion and being charitable. Not only does that improve your sense of health and well-being and self-image, but it also shows others that you are a good person willing to focus on others, not just yourself. Employers like employees that know how to look outside of themselves. He finishes up with this. Thus, the seventh and last remedy for a lean purse is to cultivate thine own powers, to study and become wiser, to become more skillful, to so act as to respect thyself. Thereby shalt thou acquire confidence in thyself to achieve thy carefully considered desires. There is more gold in Babylon, my students, than thou dreamest of. There is abundance for all, and I would definitely echo that. There is, remember some of the lessons that we talked about in the last chapter, there is so much money out there available to be made, created. And I'm not talking forgery, of course, I'm talking about the creation of wealth through the creation of business and the prosperity of business. That's the beauty of a free market. We have the power as a community, as a society, as a people to create wealth through quality customer service and business and work. Okay, that concludes our discussion of chapter three of the richest man of babylon seven cures for a lean purse please move on now to chapter four summarized and discussed <sighs> that didn't make any sense <laughs>